Um, can you hear me all right, everybody? Yes? No? Yes? Or is this better? Yeah. yeah. All right. I'll do it like this. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, shall I do it in English or Dutch? Are there English speakers in the room? I'll do it in English then, no problem. Um, well, my name is Dimitri Tokmetsis. I work for The Correspondent. We are a crowd-funded platform, media platform. We are around now for about four years. We started four years ago, I think, with about 10,000 members. Now we have about 50,000. We're opening shop in the US uh, uh, next year, so things are going pretty well. And I'm an investigative journalist for The Correspondent, and I've been asked today to give a talk about uh, some of my work I've done with uh, the other guy. Uh, oh, there, where are my slides? Ah, there he is. The pretty guy over there in that corner is, uh, is Maurits Martijn, he's my co-author, and uh, last year we published uh, this book. And the English title would be, You Do Have Something to Hide? And in the book we try to come up with an answer uh, that we heard a lot. We, you were writing about privacy for a long time, Maurits and me uh, together, for about 10 years, uh, when privacy was definitely not an uh, issue. Uh, certainly not a political issue. Uh, and every time you try to emphasize the importance of privacy, people say, well, I don't have anything to hide. And a couple of years ago, we decided, well, we should have a better answer than, well, then take off your clothes or you have curtains in your home or start a, start a very abstract uh, conversation about, uh, about the value of privacy in the panopticon, etc. So we decided to write this book. And uh, I won't talk too much about this book, but um, I will try to convey the, 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 the central message in this book, and that is that we see privacy mostly right now as an individual uh, right. And of course it is an individual right, but what we want to propose in our book, what we try to explain, is that privacy is much more. Privacy is a necessity for a lot of other rights, and privacy, we argue, is actually um, um, a collective issue, and not an individual issue. And please bear with me this, uh, this 45 minutes and I will try to, uh, to get there with you. And I've divided up my presentation into three parts. Um, first, I will talk a little bit about uh, some uh, technical stuff and I will keep that short. Uh, usually I will take a long time because uh, I talk a lot to lay audiences but you know all the technical stuff better than I do actually. So I will keep that short. Then I'll take the deep dive. Well, I will look at what kind of data are being used and what kind of data are we talking about and what can you do with that kind of data. In the second part, I will try to explain, we we'll dive a little bit deeper, I'll try to explain what is actually the problem when you use this kind of data the way that we use it now. What kind of rights are being uh, uh, put under pressure when we use uh, these kinds of data. And in the last part, I want to give you, uh, uh, an overview of a couple of principles that we can use to better make use of this data in a more privacy-friendly way. And these are really abstract principles, but I think everybody can use it in their own, their own field of work. And one of the main things I would like to talk about is that our machines are constantly gossiping about us. Why does that matter? That's the two questions. The first you have to know is why do they, how do they actually gossip? And misconception that most the nature of private information and private digital information. If you talk to uh, normal people, non-technical people, and you ask them, well, what kind of information should be protected, they will always say, well, my medical information or information, my photos or very tangible kinds of information. But there's a whole different kind of set of information that we are not talking about usually, and that are metadata. And just like Bits of Freedom, the, 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 the privacy organization in the Netherlands, we like to talk about metadata not as technical data, which it basically is, but as behavioral data, because you can learn so much about it. One of the things that you can easily learn from metadata is who are you? And uh, everybody knows uh, uh, that when they go online and they start browsing, you are being followed by dozens of advertising companies, usually through cookies. But what you see happening now that more and more people are start using uh, ad blockers is that they try to find other 
ways to track you, basically. And one of the most common ways right now is uh, through fingerprinting. And one of the things we, uh, we, we didn't discover ourselves, but we, we got into touch with some uh, really good experts in Princeton, um, is uh, Canvas fingerprinting. And that works uh, sorry, as, as follows. Your browser gets, uh, gets a command that it has to draw a certain kind of picture. And uh, every browser does this in a very unique way. A fingerprint is being made of that picture, and you cannot see that picture. But the fingerprint is unique. But uh, the browser does it always in the same way. So if you go to newprint.nl or to cnn.com, for instance, and uh, my browser gets this command, and I go later on uh, to, for instance, the New York Times, and my browser gets the same command, the fingerprint will be the same. So they have a unique identifier by which they can track you. And they kind of do the same with audio. Here's the same, the, the kind of audio uh, beacon is being transmitted and it uh, generates a fingerprint that is unique for your computer. So basically these advertisers can follow you around by generating these fingerprints, see how you try to combine it in, uh, in that way. And there's not a lot that you can do about it actually. Uh, you can, there is some protection against uh, device fingerprinting, uh, sorry, against uh, canvas fingerprinting right now, but the audio beacons are pretty hard to, uh, to, to stop. Actually, there are some companies that are using these kinds of techniques, or have been caught using these kinds of techniques, uh, to gather more data about you. And one of those is uh, Silverpush. Silverpush was an American company that uh, basically collects all the device information from, well, everybody. They uh, say they have this big uh, database with about a billion devices, uh, and they try to um, uh, see which devices belong to which persons because uh, the problem for a lot of advertisers is that we lose, use a lot of different devices when i wake up for instance in the morning i first look at my uh, uh, at my tablet and when i'm uh, uh, going to work i use my cell phone and later i use my um, use my laptop at work and maybe in the evening i'm, uh, I'm using my tv so you've got a lot of different devices and for uh, advertisers that's problematic because they lose you they try to uh, recreate the customer journey, as they call it. So what journey you take from your day through different devices. And try to link all those devices to you. And they use audio beacons for that. So they, they are uh, embedded in apps, and they are uh, signaling an audio beacon now and then. And if a device with a similar app, uh, with a similar software is around, it will pick up that audio beacon and uh, give a signal to Silverpush in this, this case. So if you're, if you're watching a, a, a gardening program on your TV, for instance, and this audio beacon is being generated and it's being picked up by your cell phone, which is in the same room, then Silverpush knows, well, these two devices are in the same room together, so they probably belong to the same person or to the same household. And for advertisers, that's interesting because the next day, when you're in the train, for instance, they can show you advertisements for gardening products or, or anything like that on your cell phone. Um, so they have this big database of who owns what kind of device, and even the FTC, so the watchdog in the, the US said, well, that, that goes a little bit far, but this, this kind of practice is uh, pretty far for the course uh, nowadays. And uh, I think last week there was an interesting, um, there was really an interesting uh, uh, study from Princeton, in this case for the CEITP, that uh, showed that even uh, some uh, the text you, you enter into uh, uh, into uh, into uh, um, sorry a website that can be uh, uh, sent to these advertisers now then uh, um, if you look at my Twitter feed I just uh, posted a tweet about it I sent it a couple of days ago my Twitter feed is at talkmetsis.com so they find these, these different kinds of attributes, these different kinds of unique ideas to follow you around. And there's not much that you can do about it. This is how it works, obviously. What are you? There's also a question that you can easily uh, 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 answer with a little bit of data. And one of my favorite examples is how the likes work on Facebook. The like is a really powerful signal that you give. Uh, you know, if you're being followed around by cookies, it's really powerful to know that you are watching a certain uh, website. But if you like something, that, that tells a lot more about you. It's, it tells you that you care about something. It tells you that you 
that you are angry about something or that you want to uh, share things with your friends or try to draw attention to certain things. So it's a really powerful signal that a company like Facebook gets all the time, of course. And Facebook employs dozens of social scientists nowadays, so anthropologists, psychologists, uh, sociologists, that just keep on looking to, this, uh, to these kinds of data. They always look at correlations between behavior and the signal, signals they are getting from, uh, for instance, what you like. A couple of guys at MIT reproduce these kinds of uh, 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 studies and they, they let people uh, fill, in, uh, fill out uh, psychological inquiries and they looked at what they liked and basically they could kind of predict there are psychological traits or uh, some really sensitive traits that they uh, possessed by looking at what they liked. For instance, they found that uh, people, uh, that based on a couple of likes, you can say something about somebody's religion or somebody's political affiliations or about somebody's age or um, those things. They also saw that uh, men who like Britney Spears, for instance, and like a furniture magazine, that they have a higher chance that they're being gay, for instance. Um, well, if you are this gay man and you like Britney Spears, which you do, and with, uh, you like this furniture magazine, what you don't realize as a user is that you're sending these kinds of signals about your sexual orientation to Facebook. How can you know about that? So this little piece of data that is really innocuous to you, that is really innocent to you, and doesn't have any value to you, does have value for Facebook. And they can do some uh, really scary stuff with it. What are you doing? That's also a question that you can easily answer with a little piece of, bit of data. And one of my favorite uh, examples is the, the, the case about the taxi data in New York. So all the taxi rides in New York are being monitored. Uh, every taxi company has to fill out, you know, send part of their database to the, to the city government. And all the rides are being logged there. So uh, who was behind the wheel, which taxi was there, how much was being paid for uh, a ride, where was the customer picked up, where was he dropped off. Everything is geolocated. So it's a really nice database. And uh, based on the freedom of information request, somebody, a researcher, got the whole database for 2013. And all the names of the taxi drivers were hashed. So the, the city of New York thought they were being privacy friendly, etc. But um, they used a deprecated uh, hashing algorithm, so it was pretty easy to, uh, to, to get all the names of the, the cab drivers in the end. So for every, every cab driver, it was known where they, would, where they were that year and how much money they earned, etc. That was not all it. Another guy got hold of the data and started looking at these kinds of pictures. And what we see here is a uh, famous movie star, Jessica Alba getting out of the taxi, and there's a lot of information in these kinds of photos. Uh, for instance, you see a license plate, so that's in the database, of course. Um, there's a location sometimes, but there's also metadata in the picture itself. These are all digital images, they're uh, on gossiping sites, um, uh, and uh, often there's metadata in the picture of when it was taken and where it was taken. So this guy used those data to see what, uh, what taxi did, did they did they take and from where to where did they travel and how much did they pay? One of the things they found out is that a couple of very rich movie stars didn't pay any fees, uh, any tips to the, uh, to the taxi driver, for instance. But they could also just look at places that were sensitive, like uh, known brothels or known uh, strip clubs, and they would see who is being picked up there around one o'clock in the morning and who is taken, uh, where are they being taken to, so where do they live? And it's really easy to find out. Where are you? That's also a question that is uh, easy to answer. But you probably, probably wouldn't guess that your battery can actually uh, give somebody with the right information a sense of where you are. And um, I have to tell you that this study was done in very controlled circumstances, so this is not something you find in the wild. But um, in order to reach uh, your signal of your cell, uh, cell phone to reach the tower, uh, battery power is needed. And when the tower is further away, there's more battery power needed than when it's closer. So there are fluctuations in, 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 in the use of your battery power. And these guys uh, in Israel, they thought, well, maybe we can just uh, let people uh, walk a certain uh, path in cities and we know where their cell towers are, and we just look at uh, how their, how their uh, battery power fluctuates, and then see if we can, if we do it again, we can find the correlations and 
we just let them walk again and then we look at the fluctuations in their revving power and then maybe we can reverse engineer how they went and, and that kind of was kind of successful. So as a user, again, you are not aware that something as stupid as your battery power can, if you have the right information, it's a really big if, uh, that can give others a sense of uh, where you are in the end. Uh, but also this, uh, uh, the example, example of Grindr and Tinder is pretty uh, scary if you think about it. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows here Grindr and Tinder, but Tinder is this dating app. Uh, you can swipe uh, for people who are close to you. You get pictures of people who are basically really close to you in the, in the vicinity. Uh, so you don't get pictures of uh, people in Moscow, for instance, if you are in Eindhoven. Uh, people who are basically dateable. Uh, the same goes for Grindr, but it's for homosexuals. So if you want uh, a date with, as a homosexual, you can use Grindr and you can see who's around you. But in order to see who's around you, there, there's an API that constantly, uh, um, that you have to query constantly as a user to, to see if people are around you. The problem of Grindr and Tinder is, is that they haven't limited, rate limited to the, the use of this API. So you can just ask this API uh, 100 times a minute for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Where is everybody, all my contacts, where are they uh, in the neighborhood? And you don't get back a, a precise uh, uh, GPS uh, location. But if you do it long enough, then you can find the patterns and you see that people are moving around all day. And they see, you see that certain people are uh, 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 on one spot at night, so then you can infer that they probably live on that one spot that they stay at night in. And a couple of uh, hackers uh, at the VU University actually succeeded in, in identifying some people uh, by location by using this API of Grindr that hasn't been rate limited. Um, one, of the, one guy I spoke to, uh, he uh, coupled this data with Facebook data, so he could basically draw a map of Amsterdam with all the old dudes that like young girls, for instance, uh, that, they have, that they have told in their uh, biography. Um, well, this is kind of scary, you know, as a user of Grindr or Tinder, I'm not aware that people can actually make maps of where I live or what kind of uh, women I like to date. But uh, if you think about Grindr, it's actually pretty uh, dangerous. Now, in the Netherlands, it's not, not really a big problem if you're a homosexual, you, you don't wind up in jail, but if you are an, uh, in the Middle East, where this app is also being used, or, or in Russia, where this app is also being used, people can actually abuse this API and find uh, people that are on, uh, on, uh, on Grindr and where they live in the end. And Grindr didn't know this, and they, they tried to uh, uh, mitigate this problem, but, uh, well, the problem is, uh, do they, uh, it's about functionality, are they willing to give up some functionality of the app in order to protect their, their users? And up until this time, for as far as I know, they don't. Yet. Um, when do you need to pay more for your services? That's also a question you can answer with a, a little piece of data. And again, uh, there's this battery thing uh, at Uber. Uber, a couple of months ago, I think a year ago, Uber um, made public that they yeah. estimate if you want to pay more for a taxi or not by, losing at, by looking at your battery power. Uh, your app has, uh, uh, can look uh, at how much battery power you still have left. They found out that uh, in the flexible pricing plan that Uber has, uh, that people are willing to pay more for a capsule ride when their battery power was low. And it's, of course, it's very logical because without uh, battery power, you cannot order a taxi anymore. But they knew about this. And Uber said, well, we are not uh, going to use this or abuse this kind of data. But you know, Uber is not the most uh, uh, scrupulous uh, 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 of companies around. Uh, so you just have to uh, take the word for it. Other companies are, uh, actually do have uh, uh, little scruples, uh, like Orbit, for instance. Orbit is a website that uh, you, know, you can book uh, planes and hotels uh, at that. And a couple of years ago, they found out that people who are uh, surfing from a Windows computer, getting uh, cheaper hotels, seeing cheaper hotels, cheaper uh, uh, plane rides than people are, that are coming from a Mac computer, for instance. And of course, it's also obvious that people with a Mac, they, I'm one of them, they, pay, they have too much money, obviously, because they have a Mac. But um, people can actually abuse these kinds of information. Um, there's also this, uh, the example of a big retailer in the US, uh, and they did research to uh, the, the price of shoes on this retailer. I think it was um, JCPenney's, I'm not sure. 
uh, but they're all over the US. And uh, they found out that the price of the same kinds of sneakers fluctuated between uh, regions. And one of, the, uh, one of the things they found was that the price was dependent on the vicinity of shoe stores. So if a shoe store was closer by, then the price would be lower, the online price would be lower than when the shoe stores were, were far away. And of course, it's obvious because you don't want to get in your car and uh, drive 50 miles for uh, $2 uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a discount on your shoes. But this is a good example to see that uh, companies can actually utilize these kinds of data and, uh, that, you, that you haven't delivered yourself basically to them. So why is this a problem? And now we get into the, to the uh, detailed part. What all these companies and also governments do is basically collect data. They want to collect data to get a view of who you are and uh, what you are doing. And you can uh, describe that uh, process as uh, surveillance. Basically what they do is surveillance. Uh, but why do they do that? Uh, why is that so important? Um, a couple of year, years ago, 2003, Three, there was this uh, uh, Canadian uh, sociologist, his name is David Lyon, he's a very interesting guy, and he's done a lot of uh, uh, cool research on surveillance practices, and he made a very simple observation, uh, it's really an open door, but I think it's really powerful, and it explains a lot uh, about what is wrong with our privacy debate right now, because he said, the, the ground motive, the most important thing, the most important reason that we do surveillance, is social sorting, it's the purpose of social sorting. And by that he means uh, we use surveillance, we use data of people to make a difference between people, to uh, categorize people. And if you think about it, most of those processes are true. Uh, if you, you can see it really easy uh, at the borders, right? when, you, uh, when you are being checked at the border, the, the guy, uh, the border agent wants to know, based on the data he has, he wants to know really quickly if you pose a threat or not, if you pose a certain risk or not, because it's not doable to check everybody and it's not necessary to check everybody, so you need this data to make a quick judgment to see who are you going to uh, uh, check extra. Uh, insurance companies do the same, of course. They try to assess risks and they put different people in different risk pools. Uh, risk categories, and if you are posing a high risk for insurance companies, then you have to pay more premiums, and if you are posing a low risk, then you can get a discount, for instance. Advertisers even do the same. They quickly want to know if you are worth of being advertised to. It sounds a little bit strange, but from their point of view, point of view that, is, that is how it works. So they want to know if the, advertisers, the advertisement is relevant to you. Relevant to you, and it doesn't lead to uh, to a buy or to a sale for them. So they really have to go uh, quickly decide who they are going to show this advertisement to, and they have to categorize all those people to see in which bin uh, you you will uh, be put. Uh, so in all these companies and all these governments, they use data to process uh, to to get a picture of you, what kind of person you are, and they try to uh, they put you in all kinds of categories, and they decide and they uh, act on that category and that is not really a, 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 an individual problem anymore because this leads to a whole different class of problems and uh, here I come to my central, uh, uh, central point that privacy is a collective problem one of them is discrimination if you start treating people differently based on their data that can lead to discrimination and there are many examples nowadays of uh, that happening um, one of my, well, one of the scariest, maybe I think, is um, is what is happening in the United States right now. There are a lot of uh, judges that are being held by uh, software to ascertain how much uh, punishment somebody gets. So somebody has been found guilty by a jury, and the, the judge has to decide how how long somebody is being put away in jail. And if somebody, uh, there's a, uh, a small chance of somebody getting uh, into trouble again, then uh, it's probably better not to put him into jail for a long time. But if somebody is uh, always getting into trouble, then you put him away for longer. That's the idea. And the idea was also that judges are, you know, grumpy old men usually, and they are biased, and they're human beings, and if somebody comes to form who is black, he has a tendency to punish somebody 
uh, uh, harsher than when someone is white. So they said maybe we should help judges with software uh, where, we, uh, uh, where we don't uh, have race as an attribute or anything. So race doesn't, isn't part of the equation there. So it's more neutral. That was the thought. So they actually, in a lot of states, they actually use these kinds of software and they give a kind of a risk score based on uh, uh, poverty levels or somebody living in an urban area or an uh, agricultural area or uh, what, they, what is, uh, uh, um, have the parents been in trouble with the law before, all those kinds of things that are not really based on race. But the result is quite different. Uh, they've done a study to do to the results and even with this so-called objective system, uh, black and Latino Americans are being punished harder for the same crimes than white Americans. And the problem is in the data itself, because the data are already biased towards, uh, 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 but, well, uh, uh, against, against black and Latino people. So you can try to uh, devise an algorithm, but it, in the end, this uh, uh, unevenness within the data will just be reproduced by the algorithm, and nobody really knows how it's being done. It's also uh, the, the researchers try to contact the company that provides uh, the algorithms and the software for this and the company said well we're not going to give it to you because that's our unique selling point so that's 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 secret so we cannot give it to you the problem is how can you check if the the, the software isn't biased then? and in this case it was biased and the same process is happening with the same research group that they have done more uh, research to this the same thing is happening with uh, with insurance premiums certain uh, black and uh, latino communities pay a lot more for insurance than uh, white people living in the same neighborhood even. so it's, it's really uh, it's really not a guarantee that uh, these kinds of uh, uh, automated systems cannot discriminate against you sorry yeah mm -hmm. well yeah uh, i have lived in uh, i've lived in the us for a while um, um, everybody there has a credit score so it's uh, there are three companies basically building that score and it says something about your know, credit worthiness and the credit score was basically uh, uh, set up in the 70s i think just as a well it's a kind of an advice but nowadays it's being used all over that's the problem uh, if you want to have uh, uh, an apartment for instance then your landlord wants to see your credit rating Nowadays, if you want to have a job, a lot of uh, big employers want to see your credit rating because uh, they get so many uh, people, uh, uh, so many letters for one job. They just want to make a quick uh, uh, rundown of people who have a bad credit rating must be doing something bad, so they are being put aside. Problem in America is, of course, uh, one of the big reasons that people have a bad credit rating is poor health. Because they don't have health insurance and they get into financial trouble when they are getting sick. Um, you see that then that the problem of the this bias in the credit uh, score is being perpetuated into other spheres, other influences like housing, like employment, for instance. So it's a really nasty piece of uh, piece of uh, information going on about it. And we do have the same thing here in the Netherlands, actually. We also have credit ratings. We are not really uh, mindful about it, but we do have them. Uh, whenever you take a, a mobile phone a subscription, for instance, you're, you, there's this company called Experian or Gradon that actually gives an advice to, uh, to the mobile phone company but that they shouldn't or, uh, or should give you this, uh, this uh, subscription, for instance, and they're being used a lot more. Sure, yeah. Any idea how to manipulate this to Well, live in the right neighborhood, you have to move. How can I manipulate my own method? Your metadata? Oh uh, yeah, there's so many metadata. That's that's a bit of a. Which web website should I visit? Uh, well, you can use. Well, I'll give you an example of uh, something simpler. Me and my wife want to go to Spain the next year, so we're looking around for air tickets. And uh, uh, of course, this also happened to you probably. You look at air tickets, you find well, that, that's nice, and then you go back, and they are uh, a lot more expensive than that. Uh, suddenly, out of nowhere. Well, you can use a VPN, for instance, in a different browser, and then uh, uh, book them by that, and then you get the old price back uh, with a little bit of luck. So it's really difficult because you don't know when it's when when you are being manipulated. But I'll come to that in a second. The second big problem is uh, solidarity, I think, uh, especially in insurance. 
Um, insurance, the insurance business is a really tough business right now because the margins are really small and, uh, and so they, they have, a, have a hard time. So what a lot of insurance try to do is uh, get a better sense of the risk that they have and the risk that we pose to them as a client. And the way they do that is to ask for more data. So uh, you've got life insurance companies that are looking at, uh, at your uh, Facebook profiles, for instance, and see how your friends are living. And if your friends are all slobs that don't sport and, and uh, party a lot, then you probably have to pay a little bit more premium because, you know, uh, uh, birds of a feather flock together. So uh, if all my friends are slobs, I'm probably a slob too. There are also life insurance in the US, uh, in this case again, that uh, give discounts to your premium if you wear a Fitbit. I don't know if everybody knows what a Fitbit is, but it's this little uh, little uh, uh, device that uh, counts your steps and to see how active you are. And those data are being sent to your insurer and they can see that you are uh, walk, uh, running marathons, etc. The strange thing is there, is also, there are also companies uh, actually uh, promising to deliver false data so you can slouch on the couch and uh, eat back potatoes and uh, binge to watch uh, Netflix while the insurer thinks that you're walking a marathon uh, right then. But, um, but also in the Netherlands uh, recently uh, uh, a, car, a car insurer promised uh, lower premiums if you have a box in your car that basically uh, uh, sees and uh, uh, tracks how you drive. For instance. And health insurance, uh, they use the, the questionnaire on uh, the, 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 what do you have in the Netherlands to aanvullen de verzekering to see if, uh, if the, what kind of premium you should have. But in the end, it's also a privacy problem. It's not only a problem that I have to deliver all these kinds of uh, well, valuable and uh, sensitive information to my insurer, but it's also it's being used against me. Because the whole idea of insurance is solidarity. So you take a group like this uh, together and we all have different uh, chances of becoming sick or uh, having trouble of getting damaged or anything. But you know, if one of us is unlucky, then the rest of us will pay. That's the whole idea of insurance. But what do you do when all those risks are being uh, individualized? That's what's happening right now. They all need this information from your Fitbit, from your car, from these questionnaires to see specifically what kind of uh, risk you pose as an individual. So you bear the brunt basically of your own risks that you uh, involve. Because if you're a high risk person, you cannot get, on, uh, uh, cannot get insured. Or you pay a high premium. So, what is the worth of what is the insurance worth anymore? Uh, maybe now it's still in its infancy, but what about 10 years? And I'll, I'll predict to you now that companies like Facebook and Google will uh, eventually enter the insurance market because they have so much information about us, they know us so well. It could be very lucrative for them. But what does it mean to be insured anymore? What does it mean about solidarity when we all bear the brunt? of our own risks, and those risks are really transparent to the companies that are providing these uh, services to us. Uh, the third problem, I think, and that this is also a problem that's still quite in its infancy, I think, is uh, what I call uh, uh, algorithmic citizenship. And that basically means that uh, the way, the manner in which you can use your rights, and utilize your rights, are more, and more getting more and more dependent on the digital your digital self, so your data, so what the, the companies and governments think they know about you. And let me give you an example, that's also one uh, uh, example in our book. There was this uh, Dutch uh, business, uh, business guy who traveled to the Los Angeles uh, for, for his work. And when he got, got to Schiphol Airport, he, was, uh, being, uh, uh, he had to step aside. Two air marshals, uh, uh, US air marshals, came to him and said, well, uh, uh, there are some problems with your reservation and uh, we want to talk to you and, and uh, yet to, uh, he was being questioned. Uh, did he go to the Middle East and uh, did he, had he ever gone to Jordan for instance and, and where did he book his trip and all, all these kinds of questions. And he was uh, put there about an hour, he all, almost missed his flight but then he was allowed to go. Once in uh, LA he was uh, uh, put into a room and was questioned again by border guards. And again, those questions, uh, when did you book your trip? Uh, have you ever been to the Middle East? Uh, were you ever in Jordan? And he was never in Jordan. He was in the Middle East one time. He never went to Jordan. All right, after one hour, he was allowed to go. And then he got into a hotel, the doorbell rang, and uh, well, there were two police officers. Well, same thing. 
And in the end, he, he didn't understand why is this a problem or why is this with Jordan. And in the end, he found out that this provider, Vodafone, uh, they had made a mistake with this uh, IP address. They just bought a block of IP addresses from Jordan uh, because there was a shortage in the Netherlands of uh, IP4 addresses. But the administration wasn't up to date when he booked his flight. So when he booked his flight, the, the Department of Homeland Security in the US thought he was booking his flight from Jordan and not from Delft, where he actually lived in the Netherlands. Um, so that was suspicious. But based on uh, all kinds of treaties that, uh, that he had, that the Netherlands had with, uh, uh, with the US, he has a certain uh, amount of rights that he can expect that are being uh, not trampled upon. He, he has the right to travel to the US, uh, basically, well, it's not without a visa, but basically there, there are arrangements that you don't have to go to too many hoops to, to, to do that. Now there's a problem for him, because of this little piece of data, he was seen as another person and who couldn't use that rights. And he's a businessman, and he's white, and he has money, so he can probably set this straight. But there are many, many examples of people who cannot uh, basically travel to the US, or from the US, or to other places. That, uh, and those decisions were being made with these kinds of faulty data. They were put on no fly list, etc., or their accounts were being freezed. A lot of uh, these kinds of issues. And I think we will see these kinds of issues more and more. That people, that bureaucracies, they, they always have um, um, they always have relied on the information they have and they always make mistakes. But the problem is when so many uh, uh, decisions about people are being automated and made uh, automatically, then it's really difficult to find where those mistakes are made. And it will have an effect on our citizenship. And the last uh, problem, big problem, I think, or we, we think, is uh, about autonomy. Because one of the problems is that we don't see what, that this is happening. You don't know that when you book a flight to the US, basically, then there it's decided if you're allowed entry to the US. It's not only when you uh, are applying for uh, ESTA. It's not when you are uh, going to skip hold. It's not when you are uh, checking in at the border in the uh, JFK airport, for instance. It's when you uh, book a flight, then it's decided all kinds of uh, uh, algorithms, etc., what your risk score is, and if you're allowed entry in the US, and if you are uh, allowed smooth entry into the US. And there are a lot of these processes that are, uh, that are using your data and make decisions about you, and you're not, most of the time, you're not aware about it. And it can really have detrimental effects. Uh, I think the, the US presidency. Uh, Elections, U.S. elections of last year are a case in point, with basically uh, Facebook deciding what our worldview is. Facebook is our window to the world, and it can be manipulated. That, that we have seen. I'm not telling you that that uh, Donald Trump would have been elected if Facebook was more transparent about it, but it was a factor in that he got elected in the end. So it's, it's something that we have to find solutions for. Um, Another example that I thought was really striking really, was a couple of weeks ago, there was a story about uh, software being used in the uh, in, uh, uh, US, uh, uh, US medical facilities that are basically trying to find uh, uh, diagnostics. Diagnostics, yeah. Um, what they did, they have this uh, big fancy computer of IBM, all based on Watson, uh, Watson uh, software. And they just fed it all the all the medical data that they, they had. And um, in a lot of cases, uh, the doctor would make a diagnosis based on all kinds of symptoms, and they would ask the computer, "What is your diagnosis?" And the computer was really really good at diagnosing, often outperforming the doctors in that sense. There was only one problem: nobody did knew how the computer got to its diagnosis. So they fed him a couple of symptoms. A lot of stuff happening with the artificial intelligence and the deep neural networks which is really, really complicated. You cannot reverse engineer it back to an If there's an output, you cannot reverse engineer it back to an input. And in the case of advertisement, that's not a problem. But if it, it's about decisions of life and death and stemming from diagnosis, it can be a really big problem. Right? Then. So where's the autonomy in that? Who has autonomy? Who is responsible in the end for when things go wrong? And those, those are big issues that we are not, uh, not really uh, uh, ready for yet, I think. So what can we do about it? There's no clear answer. I mean, 
there's so much information being used, there's so much, there many actors involved. There are private companies, there are governments, there are all over the world, there are data. Uh, when I use my cell phone today, data is going to at least 20 different countries, to at least uh, three, 300 different companies, so maybe governments can reach it, who knows. So it's really difficult to, 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 uh, to uh, as, a, as an individual, to counter this and to use this. But there are some things that we can do uh, as a society and as people working with these kinds of data. And one of this uh, is thinking different about data. Uh, what I call data minimizations and use of attributes are how to lessen the gossip, uh, if you want to put it in another way. So the problem, I think, is that too much data is being used anyway. You always have to fill out enormous amounts of information that be sent to all other, to all kinds of uh, companies and all kinds of government institutions. And often it's not necessary that they get this information. And the, you can basically uh, help these uh, governments and these institutions and companies. They have a different information need than, they, than the information they get. And let me try to explain it. Um, if I go to a liquor store, for instance, uh, well, I'm, I'm 42, so that, that means that I'm uh, above 18, I, I hope. My wife, who is uh, uh, two years younger, actually had to show her uh, ID uh, recently, so, well, she looks young. Um, but um, it's really strange that I have to show my ID card, and because there's a lot of information on my ID card. There's a photo of me, and there's my full name, and there's my birth date, which they need, kind of need. And there's uh, maybe the city where my ID card was, uh, was, uh, was given out. Uh, but the only thing that the liquor store guy or girl basically needs is an answer to a question that is, am I above 18 or not? Am I an adult? Um, that's the only thing they need. So they only need to know that attribute. They don't need all those if that information. They need my attribute, that sense. But that's a, that's a nice way of thinking about a lot of data that are being sent out, uh, the information that most of the parties need are attributes and not information per se. So you have to devise a way to give those attributes. There are, there are some nice experiments going on in, the, in the Tilburg and in Nijmegen by, by the academic group. They have devised a way to uh, ensure that you have a pass, they've made a pass for instance, and a, a little card. People, uh, attribute providers like the Gemeente, for instance, the county, or uh, some companies, or bank, for instance, they can provide that with some attributes and sign it. And, uh, so, sure, those attributes are above 18 or uh, inhabitant of, of Eindhoven, or, or those kinds of things, or a customer uh, with certain privileges. So, the idea is that you can use a card like that and don't have to give all that information uh, anymore. So, the information stays safe, it stays, stays with you doesn't get spread out, it can be hacked or anything, because the only thing you have is attributes. I think that's a really cool thing to think about, and I hope we will, uh, we will learn a little bit more about that. The second uh, thing is privacy and security by design, or how to stop the, the gossip. If there's one law, in, in the, in the, especially in the government, is that uh, when they build a database, they find another purpose to use their data for. Uh, case in point is the electronic uh, patient dossier, the electronic patient files that everybody has. It's, I think it's pretty logical that all these paper files are being digitized and that, that, that you have a system where you can share these kinds of information. I think there's a good case to be for that. Uh, but there were also warnings that other people might get their data. For instance, insurance. You don't want your insurance to get access to your uh, health data. Um, well, they said at the time, no, of course they cannot get it, and it won't happen, and that was the basis. Uh, they decided, yes, this is a good idea, we should do this. Um, in the end, you see, now this year, uh, in the name of fraud prevention, insurers can get access to your health information. And the problem is, it's too easy for them to do it, because they, it's so easy to get access to the data, it's so easy to send these kinds of data, but they should have done couple of years ago when they built the system was to make it really, uh, make it in, to build it in a completely different architecture where it's really expensive, really difficult to add new uses, use cases to it. Uh, that's really inefficient maybe and from a tax uh, paying perspective it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not always nice but if you have to change, uh, if you want to give uh, this data to other parties then you really have a strong, you need to, to, have to make a strong case to do so. You really need to say, well, 
worth the investment that this organization also gets the data and that we can use it for a different way. Because now it's too easy. There's no cost, uh, hardly any cost to it. So the decision to, uh, to, 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 to allow this function creep, as they, as they call it, it's just too, too easy to make. So you have to design uh, more limitations to the system itself and make it expensive to use the data for other purposes. And a very important uh, uh, thing is transparency. So I'll say to my face, uh, you start gossiping. Uh, when I uh, call, uh, when I apply for a loan with the bank, and I don't get the loan, and I call the bank and say, why don't I get the loan? Because I make enough money and I'm trustworthy. Uh, they probably get an answer like, well, the computer says no. So that's something that often happens, of course. The computer says no. It's a big problem. Um, but that is not enough. Anymore, I think. Uh, you are allowed as an individual to know what kind of data a company holds about you. We've tried this with Experian, which is a consumer data organization. They have data on all of us, they have data on many, many people. Um, if you ask them, we asked them, you know, or our research assistant to ask them, well, what data do you have? And they said, well, we don't have data on you, but we do have a risk profile. So that's really strange. They don't have data, but they do have a risk profile. But we, Eventually, we, we got to know the risk profile, it was completely wrong, by the way. But they also have a risk profile. And that is more important information, I think, than to know what data they actually have. So, how do they see me? How do they, uh, if they take decisions uh, based on the data, what kind of decisions are they taking? So, what kind of a person am I to them? I think those data should be available. Uh, and it's definitely an uphill battle because most companies won't give that information. But why not? Why don't you have the right to know what your insurance company knows about you? My life insurance probably knows how long, uh, when I will die, probably, statistically. Why can I know it? Based on my data and on your data. And without our data, they didn't know it. So why can I tell it? But the most important thing is if you take an, an important decision based on data in an automated fashion, you should be able to explain how you got to that result. And often these. Uh, the, the, the consequences are not important or they are okay, but when things go wrong, you should be able to explain your, your, uh, uh, your you should be explain, uh, explain how your system works. If you want to know more, there's plenty of more of this in our book, of course, so you are happy to read it. We will be coming with another edition, uh, a revised edition soon, uh, because of the slave bed. It will probably arrive in about March, but you can also order it now. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I heard on the news uh, that they have a new law that says uh, my banking information will next year or next year after uh, be sold by the bank to companies. So, uh, uh, what is this uh, used for, and uh, why is this allowed? To, uh, why is this information not private? Yeah, I think there are a couple of a couple of cases uh, concerning this. I think two. Uh, the first one was with uh, the ING Bank a couple of years ago. They they said, well, we want to give advertisers basically uh, uh, the chance to advertise through us based on the, your purchasing data, your, your information data. So that's one, one thing, and that is, it's not, I don't think that is forbidden, actually, but uh, banks kind of got scared when they, because of the backlash. Hmm? Um, there was, the banks were uh, offering this uh, service, yeah. and then somebody decided it was wrong that banks had an, uh, yeah monopoly on this data mm -hmm. and they were forced to sell it to make it commercially available okay yeah i thought uh, the second use don't case know all the details of this law yeah well i thought uh, the second uh, use case was uh, that uh, that uh, when you build a financial app for instance like uh, picky or those, those things that are really popular then you have to go through the bank like that and they try to I think that's the, the purpose of that kind of regulation is to try to open up that kind of data so that uh, third parties can actually uh, build services on top of that. The problem is, do, do you want it or not? And 
how, how much trust do you put into your those, that third party and who's responsible in the end? And I think it's kind of problematic. I think the whole purpose is that it bas basically the, the, the bank has to provide an API that uh, other people can use. So I wouldn't be too big a fan of it because you can really abuse it. But uh, I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not familiar with all the details, so I don't have a, 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 a design this. To what extent do you think the new EU rules on, and on policies on data and data usage for companies that will help on this, on all the metadata? Oh, sorry, the companies? Yeah, the, the EU is planning to introduce new rules, I uh, don't recall the name now in English, but yeah, uh, on data usage and data handling that are supposed to be much stricter. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. In, uh, in May, the, the new GDPR will be effective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that that's a big milestone. It was uh, it's GDPR, so it's a general directive. Yeah. Uh, data protection directive. GDPR. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a big piece of legislation going on. It was the, the biggest, uh, most lobbied piece of, it, uh, of uh, legislation in the European Union ever, because the the the, 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 the stakes are that high. Especially Google and Facebook and those kinds of companies, but also publishers in the advertising industry. Everybody is against it, so it must be good. Then uh, it's, there's a lot to be said about it, and it's a compromise. But I think it's pretty good. It's really uh, it's much stricter uh, for the Netherlands. Not that much will change because we already have a kind of a strict implementation of the, the current uh, uh, directive. But um, it will be much harder for companies like Facebook and Google to do what they do now in, in Europe and they have to be much more transparent about what they do and those things about uh, algorithmic transparency. Um, it's not that explicit yet in the, in the, in the, in the directive, but there are, uh, the seeds have been sown to, to make that much, to give it much more power and to start uh, asking for um, accountability of these companies. So uh, if uh, I as a company make these automatic decisions about people, I really have to be able to explain it to them soon. And uh, companies are really panicking because they don't know how they should do that. So there's a lot of panic in the, in the, in the, in the, in the digital community and I think that's a good thing. There's a question here? Oh, sorry. Do you think it's uh, uh, advisable or not? to use VPN for personal communication with state, bank and tax company. Thank you. Uh, well, it all depends on your uh, threat model, basically. So uh, if, you are, uh, if you are a journalist working in Russia, yes, you should uh, use uh, VPN, but it's uh, forbidden there, especially nowadays. Uh, if you're just a normal citizen, Living in uh, in the Netherlands, uh, having uh, uh, an access for all as your provider, for instance, I wouldn't worry too much. You also have to trust your VPN uh, provider, uh, of course. So <laughs> there are some VPN providers that are more, more trustworthy than others, but it's not a guarantee. I use the VPNs a lot, but not for banking, etc. Uh, I just use the banking app because it's pretty safe, I think. Uh, but it all comes down to your threat model. If you have something, um, if you have a uh, if you are a target for um, for the secret service, for instance, then well, you have to do a lot more than when you go on your daily lives. But I would recommend that it at least take some simple steps, uh, not using it, not not really using a VPN, but using an ad blocker so that you're not tracked that much. Uh, don't post too many personal pictures that you don't want uh, don't want to. Uh, <laughs> find it anywhere else. I don't know if you heard about Facebook last week, I think it was, that they uh, ask you to send the naked pictures <laughs> so they can find revenge porn. So if somebody uploads your naked picture, then they know it's you and then uh, they can block it. The idea is good, but I wouldn't send my naked pictures to Facebook. And don't put anything on Facebook that you don't want to find out. Uh, yeah. One well, small remark about AI. And you're right about it, it will be very difficult to find bugs in the algorithms. And as with every large and popular system, you would have to, the, the cost of error becomes very, very high mm. indeed. But we're talking about human lives, and here you would always, as always, you would have to ask how many people have to die for this one. But if AI gives a better judgment than humans, yeah. it probably have saved more mm. than it will take to debug the system to find the error. Yeah. Well, 
Uh, I completely agree with you. I don't, uh, people, uh, just make no mistake, I like this technology and uh, I'm really uh, in favor of using a lot of technology, but uh, I'm really in favor of technologists uh, using a lot more uh, ethical considerations in their work. And a lot of uh, people who make decisions, like policy makers, know a little bit more about technology and how it works. I think we need that bridge uh, far more, but it's, it's kind of a cheesy answer, I know. Uh, but um, I think AI is, of course, it's, it's very, very useful. And uh, often we want our AI to be biased. You know, I want my Spotify uh, algorithm to be biased because then I get the right recommendations. And I want my Netflix AI to be biased and my news AI, etc. I want it to be biased. But if things really matter, like when I get a loan or how much time I have to go to jail uh, or those things, I really would like a second opinion sometimes. So we have to build in this uh, kind of a second opinion possibility thing sometimes. And don't rely too much on, on the outcomes of the, of the algorithm. The algorithm is in the end just a piece of software that you just need to understand sometimes, especially when things are really, uh, when the consequences are great. Because you have a very uh, one sided view of society. And, but that's, the problem is not only the algorithm, but more the interpretation. What do you do with that kind of information? It could be really helpful, this, this kind of information, but uh, if you rely on that and you're not mindful of the other, of the side effects, etc., then, then you have a problem, then you're not doing a good job. I see a lot of people in, uh, using Facebook and they are just. Um, um, getting a, a reassurance of their own view and yeah. uh, they don't get opposed uh, me, uh, um, uh, views of, uh, of, of, of uh, questions, mm -hmm. uh, political questions or what, whatever, they, they're, it's, it's a very one-sided story yeah. and, and they are uh, being assured in their own uh, straightforward uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's and I think true. it's a very da dangerous. Uh, well, we see the consequences situation. every day. And there's a yeah. toddler in the White House, and uh, there's yeah. a far right uh, resurgence in uh, Europe. So yes, uh, <laughs> we definitely see the problem here, and many people see the problem. Uh, Facebook and Google and uh, Twitter uh, are really in a tight spot right now, and they should be because Facebook. Uh, the problem, I think, with those big platforms is that they're not honest about who they are. They say, "Well, we're just." platforms. I mean, we just provide the platform and everybody does their thing, but it's quite different. The first role is their advertisers, and we are not the, the customers, we are the products. The real customers are the advertisers. Um, they use our data. If you want to see, uh, use a uh, metaphor, you know, a lot of metaphors are always being used with privacy, you know, 1984, of Kafka, yes, it's time. Um, but, I always like to see Facebook and Google more as a kind of a matrix. You know, we are the batteries providing the data so that can be monetized and sold to advertisers who are the real clients uh, uh, in that regard. Um, yes, it's true. It's, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, and they should be honest about what they are. Facebook is a media company right now. Uh, but with very, if you see how much people they serve and how many, how few people they actually employ, it's, it's ridiculous. I'm uh, currently writing a lot about extreme and far right. It's ridiculous what kind of platform they have on Facebook. It's so easy to get. It's really difficult to get a new picture on Facebook. You know, because one of you recently had a story about a, a large woman, and you saw a large butt of her naked that was taken off by Facebook in an instant. But uh, all these far right parties, Nazi parties, they just have a platform on Facebook. So they. It's also a matter of policing and being honest about what kind of companies they are. They should invest more in those kinds of things, but it costs money and they won't spend it. You want to put it away in the uh, tax paradise. Is like, yeah, uh, I think we have to stop. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We'll next session in the next room.